прошу прощения, что я говорю по-русски, по-английски, если вы не понимаете, если я говорю слишком быстро, скажите мне. Это первое решение, это полуформально, это полуформально. Half formal выступление, my first decision is с галстуком и без пиджака, или с пиджаком и без галстука, я предпочитаю вот с галстуком и без пиджака. Что вы знаете, что это полуформально. What I hope to do in this informal talk, which is part reminiscence, part my observations about history and historiography, part a discussion of my engagement with the European University, and finally, my current thoughts about 1917 and the revolutionary moment and the legacies of Russia's revolutionary moment uh, for the post-revolutionary period and maybe even contemporary Russia. What I hope to do is answer in these ways uh, three questions um, that I've been asked over the years. Uh, one of them is why Russia? Why didn't I study France or some other comfortable country? Um, why do I spend time and energy at the European University? Uh, what did I learn from the European University? What's the benefit that I've gotten out of all this energy? And how do I understand the meanings and the importance of the Russian Revolution in terms of its role in Russia's uh, historical development and transformation? It's something I can easily do in five or, or seven minutes, I suppose. This is an especially, this last point is an especially important one, especially after uh, 1989, when all revolutions, including the French, were thrown out with the Soviet bathwater and regarded, relegated to the historical dustbin, which allows us to ignore uh, their legacy, their implications, and their meaning. So first, why Russian history? Not because I have any family member whatsoever who comes from Russia or this uh, part of the world. My, my stock is old German Jewish stock uh, who resisted the flood of Russian, uh, Russian Jewish emigres in Germany and the United States for years. And when I actually married somebody who came from that, uh, that flood, it was greeted with some disapproval, I should say, in my family. The answer is actually because of the first of the great problematic narratives I, I, I became engaged with. I was captured as a, a very young uh, person, young boy really, by the problematic literary narratives that would affect my scholarly and personal development. The great 19th century novels and writings of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and Turgenev, Otsi Dieti, Nat Pirveya Lubov, um, the historical, social, cultural, political, existential problems that these great thinkers struggled with in the middle of the 19th century. Great narratives of struggle for individual and social transformation. No, Krivaya Lubov, as I said, I even thought that Cherchevsky and Stodielet was a great writer. I, I, I didn't know yet that I had made a terrible mistake about Cherchevsky. Uh, but the book I still, assign, still have assigned to my students. Now, I took this uh, naivete in the mid-1950s to Amherst College in Massachusetts, uh, where, by the way, I was forced to read Pirvaya Lubov as my first uh, text uh, in, in a study of Russian language, which unfortunately never proved a very successful. And in the middle of my college career, two events uh, happened which uh, destabilized the self-confidence, self-assuredness of American mentality with which I am sure you are all very familiar. And the first one was in 1958 uh, when the first Sputnik circled the Earth. And I was a junior at college and this was a sensational event as you can see by the size of the New York Times headlines, and we gathered outside the dormitory waiting for this little blinking thing to go overhead. Our self-assuredness as a society uh, was uh, underwent something of a shock, but my own interest 
uh, in things Russian and Soviet, obviously, was increased. And the second, at the same time, the shock to the American social system. This was the integration in 1958, at exactly the same time, of, in Selma, Alabama, and Little Rock, Arkansas, of this huge and, and brutal conflict uh, about the stirring of the civil rights, not stirring, but the integration of the schools and the deep visceral resistance and racism of American society to this integration. Now, I left Amherst and I took my, my commitment and my, some of my naivety to, whoops, excuse me, uh, here is more of Selma, Alabama. These were images that someone like myself uh, found completely shocking. They're familiar to you. Well, I took my, I took my naivete uh, to Harvard University. Uh, it's only a slight simplification, simplification to say, but since I'm speaking informally, I can simplify a bit, that at the time there were two dominant narratives about revolutionary Russia uh, and Soviet history. Of course, there was the now strengthened, enthusiastic Soviet narrative, the inevitability of revolutionary development, the inevitability of communism, Khrushchev and the Seven Year Plan, we will bury you, this notion of ultimate triumph, complemented by the dominant American, if not European narrative, certainly the Harvard narrative, which saw the revolution and transformation as a coup, a, a set of behaviors by, by evil men, uh, born with revolutionary impulses, lust for power, Soviet history uh, was the history of a utop utopian ideology, if you followed Martin Malia, or uh, utopian politics, if you followed Richard Pipes. Now this interpretation complemented the great American narrative that great men, and at the time they were men, made great history, and great smart men made great smart history. And remember, in the early 1960s, this is when John F. Kennedy, a smart man for sure, assembled the best and the brightest to lead America in the missile race, close the gap, to, to take the American, the American uh, narrative uh, forward. Great men and great smart men made history. Struves, the Struvas, the Martovs, the Milkovs, and of course the Pipes, the Pipeses of the world, mm -hmm. believing that they know actually how to change the world. Now this narrative was thought to be under-theorized, or no, it was thought to be un-theorized. It was natural. It was as natural as the Soviet narrative. Un-theorized, but the ideologies were embedded in the narrative itself. Theory was unimportant. The best and the brightest is how we learn our history. Now, there were many differences between these two narratives, but one was fundamental. The very legitimacy of the Soviet system, the right to rule, depended on the truth of a very problematic Marxist-Leninist historical narrative. The Communist Party ruled in history's name. Government had to be successful because history determined that that was the course uh, of, of human uh, progress. And it was carrying out history's mandate in the process of building socialism and communism. The American narrative about American history could be contested without challenging the legitimacy of American political institutions. Legitimacy was not based on whether a government performed well. It was based in other institutions, uh, and it was based in, in other places. In fact, administrations consistently perform very badly, but the legitimacy is not questioned. Now, Pipes was determined not to show that Soviet history was, uh, was, was, was incorrect, but that Soviet historians were not uh, telling good history. You know all about bourgeoisie and falsificatie, and I was proudly labeled uh, bourgeoisie falsificatie in 1967, actually when I was sitting in Lenin Library, a 
a bit of a shock to read this description of myself in Historia Sicer, but I realized this is probably a very good thing for me to be. It gave me a nice classified status. Types was determined that the historiography of the Soviet period be exposed for the falsification of its history. And he organized, as a consequence of this, this journal, I only had this 1968, it was organized in 1964, Kritika, which gave its name to the current Kritika Journal, which was designed to read and criticize Soviet historiography and to expose. Here are, if you can see them, a list in 1967 uh, of all of the Soviet historians uh, who our small collective uh, criticized. Now, Pipes believed this was an urgent task. And if I had time, and maybe in the discussion, if someone asked me, I'll tell you this amusing story, true, about how I was told that an NKV agent had come to the Harvard Russian Research Center to steal the copy of Easternik Marxis that I was actually looking for for a seminar project in order that we did not have the proper sources uh, to do our critique. But it had a paradoxical effect on people like me. Reading Zion Shkorsky, Zakhar, Luria, Kazakova, Diakri, Ananish, Ginella, others, reading Bakhtin, Wharton, opened a whole new exploration for me of the type of historiography that was possible. And I took that excitement about the possibility to Stanford in 1964 to work at the Hoover Library, uh, skeptical of the argument that knowledge is power and its narrative, and determined to explore it carefully by looking at liberalism in terms of the way smart people like me Yukov found themselves uh, and conducted themselves, uh, confronted the problems of Russian transformation. And that's because of the archives and because Miyukov's library, by the way, is the foundation of the library at Berkeley. 1964, Stanford uh, at Berkeley, the American social and cultural scene was undergoing its real revolutionary struggles. This is the March on Washington, 1963, where I went with my, with my wife and my, my sister and brother-in-law before going out to Stanford. And when we got to Stanford and Berkeley, where I spent a great deal of time, here, this is, this is the Berkeley campus, this is the free, free speech movement, this is the confrontation that we first experienced of, of, of soldiers determined to repress the expression of challenge. It was a socially expressed rejection of traditional American state-centered, individually-oriented political narratives. My engagement here with social protest convinced me of the power that is located in social movements. A sharp change in my understanding about the locations of power before, I have to confess, I had actually heard of Foucault uh, and before I ever had a thought that I would, I, would, I would read Foucault. And then after finishing my dissertation, I came at just the right moment uh, to Ann Arbor in, 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 in Michigan in 1967, when I took up my position at Michigan, and this, of course, was, was, was the scene in Detroit during the summer of 1967, which was, uh, as I later referred to, which was read into the American narrative as a riot. We don't have social protests in the United States. We have riots. And the fact that this happened in Detroit, the fact that it was linked to all sorts of social conditions, uh, political marginalization, marginalization, social marginalization, did not easily enter the American consciousness. And then uh, to Ann Arbor, here's, here's, here's the most destructive uprising in American history, Life magazine, a soldier in Detroit, which was largely set to fire, and in case you've read about Detroit and its bankruptcy, here's a picture, Kolonitsky can attest to its accuracy, of the great Michigan Central Railroad building, which was burned in the protests of 1967, and to which, to which this day has not been repaired, and is still standing. 
in all of his 18 stories uh, uh, of destruction. In our verdict, 1960, uh, do I have more? Yeah, 1968, the social protest, if not full blown revolution, the formation in the event of a new narrative of social transformation now engaging American racism, of course engaging concepts of imperialism, American superiority, the whole notion of engagement in Vietnam. And it was articulated that is this connection between the event in society and the processes of social transformation. Here's some more in our picture. This is 1969, it's already two years into my teaching uh, at Michigan, and still more. Stop the war in Vietnam and black something, I can't see, but you can see how these things have come together. What is it? Black America. Oh yeah, and black America, I can see it on this one. Now this is also the time of some seminal writings about social protests. The most important of which, in my view, was by uh, Leo Hamston in his 1965-66 uh, article on the problem of social stability, not political stability, but social stability in urban Russia, uh, 1905 to 1917. And Leopold, your friend of mine, was a very important person in the founding and development of the early years of this university. And to Hamston's work, of course, came the compliment of E.P. Thompson, of Eric Hobsbawm, of Hayden White, and of, uh, of a whole range of figures who explored narratives in and of themselves uh, and the histories that underlay, underlay. I finished my book on the Russian liberals in, in the midst of intellectually rejecting many of the analytic premises of what I now understood as a problematic liberal historical narrative. Instead, I looked, began to look at the ways in which forms of social protest could always also uh, bring change. Uh, here is, here is the, uh, the, the Kent State, the famous uh, Kent, Kent State massacre uh, uh, of 1970. Uh, and here is uh, one of my favorite pictures of 1917, which actually graces the cover of, a, of an American Historical Review version uh, of women in their protests in 1917, before gender became a useful category of analysis in the event we could see gender in action. And then came, of course, the welter of terms and posts, the complexities of social transformation, familiar to you, of course, Foucault, Derrida, Raymond Williams, Lockman, Pagliani, not in terms of the intellectual or theoretical content alone, but in the ways that they help us understand, try to understand contemporary as well as historical events. Theory linked to contexts, uh, contemporary contexts and historical contexts as part of a serious engagement of understanding the processes of social transformation. And in Michigan, we had a wonderful seminar called Comparative Study of Social Transformation, where I finally did read Foucault uh, and other important uh, theorists of the period. A fantastically interesting, stimulating time, especially for a Russian and Soviet historian, um, which became even more interesting in the late 1970s and the 1980s as transformations, transformations uh, occurred here as well. Now, from the very beginning in the 1990s, the European University was a great challenge, and my engagement with it initially had to do with the challenge that it represented. Its mission to help basic concepts, Nikolai Vrisic probably wrote them and remembers them well, they should be in the archives soon, 1992. The basic concepts, uh, the basic uh, mission, I call your attention to, if you can read it, the beginning of the second paragraph, second paragraph, maybe the Second paragraph uh, as a whole, a mission to help generate the social and intellectual capital that had the capabilities at least of understanding and analyzing the problems of social transformation and change to provide the intellectual foundations in humanities and social sciences 
to address them, the effort was an enormous one. Here is an early letter I got from Paulina Baptina, who I first met trying to assemble the uh, library, and she encouraging, I sent back a letter encouraging uh, of, of my own, saying I would try to find some, uh, some help for this, for this project, and I want you to read these carefully. There were rejections <laughs> almost every week in the mail. All, all these foundations said, no, but we're not interested in social transformation, we're certainly not interested in social science and humanity, no, and so forth. Now, it was really uh, a privilege and a pleasure to, to be involved in, in this effort. The first proposal for uh, open postgraduate courses, and then uh, some uh, real success. Um, if you can, yeah, if you can read this. Uh, this is uh, uh, Nikolai Victor writing me that, that we have $36,000 now for, for the first open courses. Uh, 400 applications uh, for the open courses. It looked like we were getting to a great start. $34,000, 400 applications, real challenges and real, real pleasure. Now, some departments, it was easier than others. I'm not saying that it was easy, but it was somewhat easy. Uh, our history was relatively easy to establish our new foundations, um, um, political science and sociology, especially sociology developing a new discipline. I would say anthropology is the, also the, the development uh, under, under the guidance of Babur uh, and Latin and Yelenton and Ryoskin uh, and political science and Gelman and uh, Tronkina, uh, Karkold and others. Relatively easy, relatively easy. And here's an interesting, here's an interesting email from from Juan Carpolden in 1967, telling me about this great idea they have of an international program, and we're going to have something like an IMARAS program. I will give these to the you of uh, for her archive. And here are the first open courses in history. But history was perhaps more difficult and perhaps most difficult in terms of how one could structure uh, new teaching and new approaches and new conceptualization. Uh, the first open courses included, uh, as you can possibly see on the left, a venerable academicians, uh, academics from the Institute of History, uh, and some young upstarts like, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, Borisovanov in this field. Uh, on the bottom of that list, uh, under Kassov <coughs> and Paniak and Ananich and Lurie and, 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 and others. The first, first open courses, um, it was terribly difficult to give credibility to new approaches which did not seem to challenge the fundamental empiricism with which most uh, good Russian Soviet historians had, uh, had developed their reputations challenging uh, to integrate new understandings of what constituted historical truth uh, with both older and newer kinds of facts. So rumors turned out to be facts, although that's still a disputed issue among some historians. Symbols turned out to be facts that historians could look at. Constructions of gender, identity, even empire create facts. Narratives weave these and other facts into interpretive historical truths. Archives are both repositories of historical facts and creators in their selectivity, in their structures of certain types of historical knowledge and allow certain types of narratives to be written. In short, the challenge of the history department was to introduce into teaching and research the central historiographical relationship between empirical facts and the interpretive and analytical foundations of historical Truth. I had enormous respect from Vicky Musevich, Panyak, the first dean, from Mikhail Markovich, Akron, uh, the Dekani, who devoted such enormous energy and hard and necessary administrative work, sacrifice in pursuing what I think is a real social obsession and goal. And for me, what was so rewarding was I learned 
great deal in this process. And indeed, my engagement with Galina Diorovna about the role of archives in the production of, of, of knowledge and the idea that archives create their own narratives led me on no small tension and, 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 and a book about uh, archives. Uh, Soviet archives were designed to tell the great Soviet story. And uh, starting with it, Sigur at the time, the archive of the effective revolution. The importance of understanding how archives themselves influence the kinds of questions historians can ask, do ask, and the types of answers uh, that are available to them. So, what have I, what have I learned from all this about uh, revolutionary Russia? Well, I have tried to do this fairly quickly, maybe 10 minutes more, try your patience, uh, distill the means of 1917 and its legacy in 10 or maybe 12 minutes, if you'll allow me. First, it's a very obvious uh, historical truth, if you'll allow me that, that individuals, of course, matter. Uh, Nicholas II mattered, Lenin mattered, Kiersky mattered, Putin matters. Individuals can clearly make history, if not entirely as they choose to quote an unlimited 19th century uh, social philosopher. Second, also I think obvious, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, power is also located in social movements, in social interactions, in families, even in certain cultural forms, and in emotions and subjectivities in terms of the way they may find expression through acts and through certain types of behavior. Locations which are very difficult to discern but whose difficulty in terms of discerning them and researching them does not diminish their importance. And third, maybe less obvious, uh, obviously, has to do with the importance of contingency, of circumstance, of context, in which both individual and social movements find themselves, uh, and which consequently, in terms of circumstance and in terms of context, lie at the core of historically determining whether or not individuals or social movements gain some purchase. Now, the context and the circumstance creates the problems that social movements and individuals try to solve in the midst of a revolutionary or actually any transformational moment. So I would postulate that problems are also historical facts of a sort. In other words, a form of historical truth can be located not only in political and social facts, but also in the problems, the challenges that successive political systems in and after revolutionary Russia needed to solve. The big problems themselves that revolutionary politics and social movements were forced by circumstance to address and try to solve. Let me discuss very briefly what I think are three of the biggest problems. The first, relatively easy to research, the problem of, oops, I'll come back to this one, the problem of increasing, an increasingly intractable scarcity, get a seat beginning with the scarcity of military supplies at the front, spreading through requisitions, the breakdown of transport, inflation, hoarding, leads, of course, to red lines, riots, protests in 1917, culminates in the darkest moment, moments of life in catastrophe uh, during 1918 to 1922, when the Great Famine uh, sweeps away so many millions, especially in the countryside. Very uh, difficult to document, but answers to the questions about the nature of scarcity are in the archives, as the work by Igor Varsky and others, I think, amply dem demonstrate. How to deal with the problem of scarcity? One big problem. Second big problem, violence. Much more difficult to, to, to document uh, in some ways. Uh, answers are available in and outside the archives, memoirs, photographs, letters, 
lot of material without, uh, uh, much of the balance is not easily attainable in the archive. And of course, as it's related to the war and the Civil War, it needs very little rehearsal here. As distributive systems became less and less effective in the distribution of scarce, more and more scarce goods, violence was increasingly seen itself and used itself as a solution. Requisitions, confiscations, seizures, the breakdown of law, breakdown of morality, violence penetrate society, especially, but not only in the countryside, the vianizatia, a word I like better than militarizatia, the vianizatia uh, of uh, everyday uh, life in, in this period. But the third problem is very difficult to research and maybe most important, and I would describe that as the problem of loss. What do I mean by loss? loss in all of its forms. That is the psychological dimension of loss uh, in terms of mortality and loved ones, the breakup of families, the devastation of loss in that sense, loss of a sense of stability, loss as now Nabokov wrote about loss of childhood. Nabokov, as you probably know in speak memory, said he would never forgive the Bolsheviks for taking away his childhood. Uh, loss in all these ways, catastrophic loss of life, dislocation, security, stability, and their emotional and psychological accompaniments. Now, it's estimated that approximately 30 million people in revolutionary Russia perished between 1914 and 1922. A time of anxiety, fear, anger, hope, where subjectivities around this loss certainly condition behaviors in ways that are very difficult to understand. My most recent scholarly efforts have been trying to get at some of this. i show you very briefly these poor soldiers on the front riding home, these patriotic letters, uh, which really were just a way that they could tell people at home that they were still alive when they were still alive. Uh, revealing all sorts of military secrets about the location of their units uh, in the hope that that will allow letters to come back, to deal with the subjectivities, to deal with the emotional mood and level uh, of, of, of the soldiers, or the peasants, but of course uh, not, not only. I would suggest, I cannot, by the way, here uh, begin to explore the range of solutions that were brought to there. They bear remarkable similarity in stages here. Instead, I have to suggest that if we look at revolutionary periods, the Russian revolutionary period in particular, in terms of the big problems which contextualize politics and ideologies in this period, perhaps the singular historical truth is that even the government of saints could not have solved them, or I might put it less provocatively, they were exceptionally difficult, even for the best and the brightest to solve, if not possible. And these three big problems that I want to identify affected political structures and systems subsequently, affected ideologies and explanations about why, and affected both the urgency, passion, and the methods, usually violent, that were deployed at the time afterwards to address them. So, can I say anything about the legacies of these big problems? What I would say is that much, in my view, of what is very crucially important about Soviet history is how successive regimes also attempted to deal with them and also largely failed. And here, I, I hear things that I know you know very well, probably better than I do. Take, take scarcity or the permanent conditions of material deficit and its uncertainties from Stalin to Gorbachev and its relationship to a bright future where everyone's needs were satisfied, the narrative of bright and radiant future having power in part because of its promise in terms of overcoming these deprivations. But also the evil consequences uh, of a culture of need where successive 
uh, Soviet regimes, especially the Stalinist regime, continued to believe the struggle for material security and well-being both required and rationalized the most forceful of methods. Now, scarcity was certainly not the only source of Stalinist and other violence. There are all sorts of other sources, including psychopathology, including uh, a certain kind of Stalinist social system. But scarcity and a fear of its destabilizing and destructive effects was certainly one of the principal factors conditioning violent Soviet politics and policy, maybe from beginning to the very end. So what about the most difficult problem of all, that of catastrophic loss, the 30 uh, million or so, in all of its meanings and legacies, from the subjective uh, to the sheer physical destruction that this period produced. And I'm going to conclude, because this is an informal Bies Kijeka, Mr. Uh, Peña, uh, with three, by offering me three uh, hypotheses, if you want to be scientific about it, or, 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 or propositions. The first uh, proposition, which I think you could probably agree with uh, without too much difficulty, is that loss in all of its dimensions demographic, social, psychological, even its relationship to identity formation is one of the significant understudied or unstudied problem of early Soviet history and a significant element of the foundations of the Stalinist system. Consider that we know a great deal and have paid an enormous amount of attention to the 30 million who were lost between 1939 and 1945 which has preoccupied our attention. But we know very little about the consequences of an equivalent number who were lost with all of the elements that then involved uh, in the early part. We really know nothing about the ways in which these two periods might be connected and what their implications might be. Loss demands, requires some form of mourning. It requires some form of memorialization a reach for closure of some understandable sort, try, it's almost an existential question in many cases, uh, to try to come to grips with what life has thrown up. Yet the Bolshevik argument, the Soviet argument, the Stalinist argument, that loss was explainable as a fact of inevitable historical transformation, just too bad, you were on the wrong side of history, and, and uh, not on the wrong side of history, right side of history, but in the wrong place in history, it's very difficult to accommodate suffering in these terms. Far easier to demonize, instead, imagine source, sources of its agonies in ways that don't bring closure. The enemy syndrome, finding people responsible, to powerful in great part because blame could easily be laid understanding could not easily be found, even if loss itself could not be memorialized, or in some cases, even remembered. Uh, it was virtually, by the late 1920s and early 30s, almost a crime to remember well what history uh, one had experienced. Now, how deep was this legacy on Soviet development? I don't know. Uh, serious historical work has been done on Soviet subjectivities, uh, the early work of Karkordin, Helbert, Kafka, others, the Porsche Stalin, Stalin uh, conference uh, that we had at the European University, that you had at the European University, that uh, Anatoly Pinsky and others, uh, Anatoly uh, organized, uh, was, I think, a, a very important step bringing together new parkhordi, new approaches to understanding subjectivities in all of their dimensions in the late, uh, later style, the post-style period. But there's almost nothing done on the 1920s and even on the 1930s. So, second proposition, equally problematic for the great Soviet narrative. By 1970s, 1980s, the narrative itself clearly, as you know, could no longer carry the weight it was intended to bear when abundance, security, well-being 
were permanently located in some distant, unattainable other shore, and where the utopian capitalist alternative, Santa Barbara, uh, for example, was increasingly familiar and increasingly attractive. I would suggest that the collapse of the narrative was a central element uh, in the collapse of the Soviet uh, political system. But here's a third proposition and a new problem in terms of the implication of loss. The collapse of the narrative, along with the collapse of the Soviet Union, created a great loss in itself, an enormous human toll of the 1990s, as well as all the dislocation, psychological, social, emotional, sense of security, identity, which is almost certainly having an effect and almost certainly has affected uh, post-Soviet society and contemporary Russia. Suffering, dislocation, repression of the Stalinist period, in particular the Soviet period, for what purpose? 70 years, for what purpose did we go through all of that? Uh, extremely difficult issue. Now, I used to end my lectures on Soviet and post-Soviet history by, by, by talking about the, the, uh, in the, in the 1990s and the early 2000s, by talking about the fact that one of the things that I liked most, that was most encouraged about, encouraged about in terms of contemporary Russia was there was no new narrative to replace the discarded uh, historically inevitable, uh, narrative historical inevitability. Uh, Post-Soviet Russia for a while was a kind of wonderful example of a post, kind of post-modern reality um, with all the chaos uh, that that in implied. And I thought that was a very good thing when people ask who that idiot was here, as Shannon did at his conference every year, late 1990s and early 2000s, people simply had no answer. And now a new narrative is emerging. And here I, I take the liberty of showing, showing you something you all know. I mean, showing you a building that you all know. And the really stunning recreation of the Russian State Historical uh, Archive, uh, a building on Navarrezna and Iskava Flota, which for a while we thought was collapsed with all the materials in it. Uh, literally millions and millions of dollars poured into what is the best without question, most contemporary in its equipment, in its building, uh, archive in the world. Opened by Vladimir Vladimirovich, and here, if you'll pardon me, is a Kartetyeka with a small, a friend of mine objected to this term, but I'm going to use it anyway, with a small icon uh, on top of the uh, Kartetyeka, just in case when you open the Kartetyeka. Uh, you might have forgotten who was created and who was responsible <laughs> Uh, for this magnificent, magnificent building. And what, what about this? This is, this is one of, I think, the more important things that I've learned in my association with European University. That the archive and the investment in the archive connects contemporary Russia with its pre-revolutionary historical past, just almost like jumping over the intervening uh, 70 years. And we see a new narrative emerging, centered again on certain kinds of historical understanding. A new narrative which is refusing to understand, explain, accept loss that the 90s reflected, recasting the story itself in ways that rekindle explanatory enemies, restore discarded historical dignities, and which now suggest and even demand a particular and rather problematic kind of historical truth be written, narrated, and told. And which most important, if you will allow me, which again I think serves first and foremost to further legitimize the regime, not to further historical understanding, to center legitimacy on and in a particular form of historical understanding. Legitimization, again, based partly on, largely on, a problematic historical narrative. I am concluding, and I want to emphasize what you all know.
then all of this exacerbates the problems, the challenges that the European University has faced and continues to face and is certainly going to face in the future. Uh, in some ways, our successes are remarkable, but I have to say that I think the challenges today may be even more important and even more significant and certainly more difficult to overcome than in 1994 and 1995 when you know, it, it, it was relatively, relatively, not to diminish the efforts and the challenges that, that uh, uh, Lise Maksimovic and, 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 uh, and Nikolai Borisovic were engaged in, all of you were engaged in. But an effort now for free and independent scholarship, a clear objective research, sophisticated understandings, informed conceptualizations, an effort to understand the problems of problematic narratives and social transformation of all kinds all kinds. So, can I say the European University for me it's been a great uh, privilege, a great pleasure, and indeed an honor to be part of the process to share your company, to have learned from all of you uh, so much for so long.